All right. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening for those of you who are in Europe. Um, I wanted to talk to you today a bit about the circular economy and how it can be used as a tool for development. Before we get into some of the details of development and different industries that are using it, though, I thought we might do a quick introduction of what the circular economy is. The circular economy is an economic system that attempts to provide innovative solutions for global challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, waste, and pollution. With a circular economy, we attempt to create a closed loop system, minimizing the use of resource inputs and minimizing the creation of waste and pollution. Now these days, most of us live and operate in traditional systems that are based on what we call a linear economy or an economy that in layman's terms can take, make, consume and waste. Most products are destined to become waste because of how they are designed and made. This is something that is known as programmed obsolescence. And I imagine you have used this phrase in great frustration when talking about cell phones, computers, any Apple product has about two to five years of a lifespan and then it will magically stop working, requiring you to go buy a new one. But this doesn't just apply to digital devices. In fact, programmed obsolescence is something that is inherent to all products that are made within a linear economy. Any product you buy or use, a pen, for example, has a lifespan. Once that pen runs out of ink, unless it is a refillable one, you will throw it away. The components become useless. This is programmed obsolescence. You will have to go out and buy new pens, unless you're one of those people who uses refillable fountain pens. And then you're having trouble finding them these days, at least in the US. So the idea of a circular economy is to keep products, materials, equipment, and infrastructure in use longer, and also to make waste material and energy into inputs for other processes. This is something called waste valorization. It's simply a change in mindset. We no longer think of these products as waste, but rather as resources for a new process. In fact, one of the simplest forms of circular economy is one that I'm sure you're all familiar with, it's compost. The waste that you create in the kitchen when you are cooking dinner will be put into a compost bin, a compost pile, maybe nowadays sent out to a compost service. It will be processed, remanufactured and recycled into a regenerative resource for nature. So instead of simply throwing out your banana peel, that banana peel will be processed and you can use it in your garden to help your plants grow. There are three main pillars of the circular economy. To eliminate waste and pollution, to keep products and materials in use, and to regenerate natural systems. Now all three of these ideas are often linked to the sustainable development goals and to green economy plans. But circular economy goes a step further Instead of just trying to reduce emissions and pollution, the circular economy attempts to close the loop to make a system as efficient as possible, not just with reducing one thing, but in increasing and making production a more positive, have a more positive effect on the environment. Now in 1966, this idea as an economic idea started being developed. And in 1988, the term circular economy first appeared in the journal Economics of Natural Resources. But it kind of floated for a while. And then three events took place in the early 2000s. First, there was the explosion of raw materials prices from 2000 to 2010. Then there was a Chinese embargo on rare earth materials. And then there was the global economic crisis of 2008 2009. All three of these events really propelled the idea of circular economy forward as people realized that we could no longer simply depend on what seemed to be an unlimited supply of natural resources. I think that's when the realization really set in that we were a bit limited. Today, of course, we have both the issues of climate change and the benefits of the digital revolution that are continuing to drive the, this idea forward. 
With the digital revolution and the internet of things, AI, blockchain, all of these are key enablers. They allow us to better analyze and design our products for a circular economy. Now, all of this is grounded in the study of feedback-rich systems, and particularly living systems, in which you have, for example, a dead animal body that is giving life to flies, maggots, lichens, mushrooms, that are then going on to feed plants and animals that will then feed other animals, and then that animal will die and the cycle restarts again. Now, I know that's a very simplified explanation of the natural process, but the idea is to do the same and create a closed loop, but within industrial and economic settings. Our contemporary understanding of this comes from a variety of concepts and philosophies, all of which share the idea of closed loops. There are the laws of ecology, regenerative design, looped economy, and biomimicry. One idea in particular that has been quite interesting is what is called cradle to cradle design. Now, this design is a bit different. Most of the concepts that I mentioned previously simply look at quantities of reduced waste. However, cradle to cradle focuses a bit more on quality in an attempt to account for human safety and environmental health. In recent years, Cradle to Cradle has taken a bit of a lead role in the discussion of circular economy because we are seeing that quantity, while important, sometimes needs to take a backseat to quality. Of course, all of this comes back to that initial idea presented in 1966 that instead of having an open economy with input resources and output sinks, we want a closed economy where these resources and sinks are tied together so that they can, so that products and materials can remain as long as possible in the economy. These ideas have been taken up by governments, institutions, organizations, but also businesses and corporations. For example, Dell Corporation, which builds computers and electronics, was one of the first to offer a free recycling program. In this program, you take your computer back to Dell, or you can put it in the mail in a box that they provide you free of charge, and you send it back. Dell scientists, machines, whatever, will then take the computer apart, reuse components that are reusable, and recycle anything else. Well, this is all a huge part of their marketing campaign. They say that they reuse about 80% of the components in old computers, which is great. They are no longer reliant on finding new sources of natural resources. In fact, they have a great resource in old computers that I know all of my old computers are simply sitting in my closet. I could turn them into Dell, Dell could reuse them. They would be off my hands. That's wonderful. Dell is also marketing themselves as being a very green business because of this, but let's be honest, one of the main benefits for Dell is they are saving a lot of money. Circular economy, in theory, benefits all members of the society. Another interesting example is that of the textile industry. And recently, I'm sure you've all heard people talk about fast fashion. Fast fashion is something that has really pushed the linear model and very much pushed programmed obsolescence. In the past 15 years, clothing production has doubled, but usage has dropped by 40%. Less than 1% of this clothing is then turned into new clothing or new products. This is a huge waste creation process. This leads to an economic value loss of $500 billion per year but it also has negative environmental and societal impacts. This clothing is thrown away, it goes to landfills or it is incinerated, both of which contribute to air, water, pollution. But there are also negative impacts on human rights. With the demand so increased for fast production of cheap clothing, workers' conditions are often not appropriate. However, with a circular economy, the textile industry could become more sustainable. The industry could focus on phasing out substances of concern, substances that create problematic microfibers and plastics that get into the water supply. They could transform how clothes are designed, sold, and used, and they can 
create a more effective use of resources and move to more renewable inputs. One leader in the development of circular economy in the textile industry is the outfitter Patagonia. Several years ago, Patagonia started to create a program called Worn Wear, clothes that you had worn that you can still wear. One thing they promote is the long lifespan of their clothing. They have encouraged people to post pictures on social media or talk about an article of clothing that has survived generations in their family. And it's fun. You see pictures of some parent in the 70s who was out hiking a mountain, and then their grandchild in the 2020s who's out hiking the exact same mountain wearing the exact same jacket. It might have a few patches, but it's the same thing. They also allow you to send in your clothing to be repaired for a small fee, or you can send clothing in, receive a gift card in exchange. They will repair it and then resell it on their website. If you go to buy something on Patagonia, you see a little button at the top that says worn wear, and you can click on that and buy clothing that has been patched in all kinds of colors. And a lot of people actually really go for that because they find it more interesting and more fun. Other designers like Stella McCartney and Eileen Fisher are also encouraging recycling of old clothing. And there are even take back programs that repurpose post-consumer waste like old denim jeans, retired climbing rope, and other textiles. They take all of this material and create new products with it. Now, most of that is good for developed countries, but I promised you we would be talking about development. So one place that might be a little bit, have to think outside of the box to get to, um, in which developing countries can really use these ideas of circular economy is in the water sector and agriculture. Now, wastewater and water treatment are essentials for, or wastewater is always created and water treatment is essential for all societies. However, we know that about 80% of wastewater globally is simply put back into the environment without any form of treatment. And a lot of this is because the infrastructure does not exist in rural areas so that people can have their wastewater treated appropriately at a treatment plant. But Again, like I said, we need to stop thinking of this as waste and start thinking of it as a resource. I'm going to say something that sounds disgusting, fecal sludge. Fecal sludge is exactly what you think it is. It is the wastewater that comes out of your toilet. Fecal sludge, however, is a magnificent fertilizer. So this thing that sounds like terribly wasteful can actually be a very significant and important resource, particularly in developing countries that currently depend on outside sources of synthetic nitrogen-based fertilizer. So the idea of the circular economy is this. Most families in rural areas currently have a septic ditch or a drainage system in their yard. The fecal sludge will build up in this area and currently they empty it out by washing it and putting it out into nature. However, in a circular economy system, the family could collect the sludge in barrels and take it to a company. This company is a local company that has set up its own treatment plant. This sludge can be used and processed to create fertilizer that the company can then sell to farmers. And the company will also filter out the water that can be sent to farmers for irrigation purposes or it can be returned back to the utilities board. Now the families are actually paid for this fecal sludge that they provide. So it's a source of income for the family, a source of income for the company that is then selling to farmers and a great source of fertilizer for the farmers. So all of this, everyone is a beneficiary and eventually this water will be returned through the utilities board or through just irrigation use and the family will come back to be using it again the family will then have fecal sludge that they will sell to the company, so it closes the loop. A similar thing can happen with utility companies that have this excess fecal sludge from their own treatment processes. They can sell it to the same company, the company will process it into fertilizer, and once again, we're closing the loop. This is the system that is currently being built and used in Senegal. They are basing their new systems on this model. 
And they're seeing that it is providing for families and farmers, but it is also encouraging sustainable growth. There's job creation with the development of these companies that are processing the fecal sludge. There's also a lot of economic development happening. Families have a new source of income that they didn't have to really do much to build. And this income is then being put into developing their village or it's being returned into the economy in other ways. In fact, what many scientists and economists are saying is that developing countries could in fact leapfrog developed countries. Developed countries will have to tear down existing systems and rebuild, but developing countries can start at this circular economy point. So we can all see that there are many environmental and health benefits, but most governments are asking about the bottom line. They have economic ambitions, they need to create jobs, as we all know, most governments like to be reelected, and so they need to keep their constituents happy. The good news is this works. In Kenya, they have developed a new waste management and recycling platform. In four years, they have created over 2,000 jobs. The great thing about a circular economy is it creates both low skills jobs, processing waste, and jobs for the skilled workforce, remanufacturing and recycling processes. So while developing countries in the past have often been a source of raw materials that were exploited by developed countries, now they have a way to create and use their own resources in a much more sustainable way and a way that keeps the benefits, economic and societal, within the country. This can also counter the erosion of traditional industry opportunities caused by automation and new technologies. Whereas in the past, developing countries would not have been able to keep up with developed countries and the new technologies, now they have an opportunity to in fact do better. So all of this has been quite popular. And in fact, in 2018, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations Environment Program, and 40 other partners launched the platform for accelerating the circular economy, or PACE. So PACE is one way that we are hoping to see more circular economy initiatives take place. And I hope that in the future, we will see more very successful examples of this in the developing world and in developed countries worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy, fantastic speech. I almost cried while trying to interpret it, but it was really, really good. <laughs> no, that's me. No practice for several months, so super good.